What's up guys, welcome to the Back on Track podcast with me, Sam West. In every episode, I interview someone who's changed, recovered, or become successful after having faced real adversity in their lives. On today's episode is Lauren Windle. Lauren is an incredible person and her story is all about overcoming addiction. After three years of drinking and taking cocaine almost every day, Lauren finally managed to get sober with the help of family and friends and is now a public speaker, a journalist, and also helps other recovering addicts too. So without further ado, let's get into the interview and find out how Lauren managed to get herself out of that really tough place that she found herself in. And Lauren, first of all, thanks so much for taking the time to come on the podcast and I really, really appreciate it. And how are you doing this morning? How's how's everything going? Yeah, I'm doing really well. I've, I've got up early, I've done a run, I'm ready for you, so I'm feeling fresh. <laughs> That sounds incredibly wholesome, a lot more wholesome than my morning, actually. But anyway, we'll get we'll get straight into it. Lauren, I guess the, the best place to begin is like in, in your eyes, where does your sort of story of addiction start? Because I know that you didn't actually uh, end up taking cocaine, the drug that you got addicted to until you were 22, mm-hmm. um, which is quite late on in some in terms of some stories of, of addiction. So. But were there sort of signs that you might have been susceptible to to addiction before that? Or was it kind of in your eyes, that's where where it all began at the age of 22 when you when you tried it for the first time? Yeah, so definitely not. I, so I'm also uh, I'm recovering cocaine addict, but also alcoholic. And I started drinking at 13. So addictive patterns and things were definitely developing through my teenage years, but just with alcohol, not with drugs, because I didn't have access, I didn't have money hadn't tried um, drugs until quite a lot later, as you say. Um, So I suppose if you're attributing an addiction to starting to when somebody feels, I guess it would be out of control with their consumption, then it would probably be around 16 with alcohol. I would make decisions like not to get drunk or just to drink a certain amount and and would never manage to uphold those. Um, Yeah. I think, <clears throat> excuse me, I think um, actually though, the, I mean, it's been said quite commonly, so anyone who get, engages with like addiction chat will have heard this before, but, but the way that somebody acts out is really just a symptom of a deeper problem. And those problems started far earlier in life. So way before, um, way before alcohol was even part of my sort of consciousness. And it's, it's a really common story when you speak to people in recovery that actually they just felt, well, actually I won't speak for them. I'll speak for me. I felt like just on the outside, like I was always working to try and be accepted, like I was never quite, um, I was I was never quite popular enough or, or funny enough or good looking enough. And I always really, I struggled to find my place. I felt like everyone had been given this like rule book for life that I must have missed the day when they handed it out because everyone seemed to know, you know, how to behave and what to do and and I just completely missed it and yeah and I, and it, I felt quite a lot of anxiety around that I think everyone needs to feel a part of needs to feel accepted and things like that and even if I was being by the people around me um I, I still didn't feel it it didn't sink in you know sure yeah sure so then you discover alcohol and I guess that kind of made you feel like you you did fit in and gave you that sort of social confidence was was it kind of like you tried this thing and thought hey actually this makes me feel a lot better or yeah. how, how were your sort of early experiences with it I think two things one is that I felt more confident I felt like I was more a part of the party and funnier and, and getting involved but also like when I was drunk I didn't didn't even think about whether or not I was part of it. Like it was, it was partly the sort of enabling of of my sort of socializing and eradicating of my anxiety, but also just meant that I didn't have to engage with, with those negative feelings Yeah, because I was distracted. It was just a distraction. Sure. It just kind of blocked everything out. Yeah. Mm. I can understand that. So how often were were you drinking then from sort of the age of 16 through those sort of t- late teenage years, 16, 17, 18? Was it just like a sort of binge drinking weekend thing or was it actually something that became, you know, like m- more often than that? What was the sort of pattern back then? So I 
was through school years, definitely binge drinking weekends. When I went to, um, I had a gap year where I worked in a bar and then went off to university and then it just became more frequent. But I think that the issue with that is that that is like everyone's story. You know, yeah. like there are so mm. many people who haven't got any sort of problem with alcohol, but through school they drank on weekends and at university they drank through the week and on weekends. And then they calmed down when they sort of got their job and they realized that that's not massively sustainable. They had a few too many hangovers and they were like, oh, I'm going to bring this in. I'm not a student anymore. Um, yeah. And the difference sort of came when I tried to rein it in and I and I found that I couldn't really, that I was constantly making deals with myself. I was breaking and fighting against myself and finding myself in situations I didn't want to be in. And um, yeah, and that's, and that's sort of when I realized that it was part of a problem. But to be honest, I think that, so after university, I got a job and it was not long after that, that I was 22 and started taking cocaine, as you've already refer referenced. And it's so, I think if I hadn't taken cocaine, I would still be drinking. It's because drinking heavily is so easy to justify. Yeah. It's so easy mm. for it to go unchallenged, for nobody to say, or like one or two of your friends might say, you don't, you know, we don't always like it when you're drinking. You don't always come across very well. Like you're starting to frustrate us. That would have happened. And I would have made lots of attempts to sort of cut down um successful or otherwise but when you're taking cocaine and you're taking cocaine not just once a week but then you've started taking it two three times a week and then that means that your nights are longer and you're drinking far more in those stints of, of using there's really no question that you've got it wrong you know yeah absolutely yeah and kind of drinking is it, it's so uh ingrained in our culture isn't it it's mm -hmm. so like accepted especially binge drinking yeah so it's very easy to sort of like personally not recognize it as a bit of an issue and for people on the outside to just think oh you know they like they like going out and there was always that dread when you go to the, the doctor like the gp and they give you that <laughs> thing like do you smoke yes do you drink and you sort of and they say how many units no one really knows what a unit is anyway so exactly you just yeah. got a clue and then yeah. they're like okay well we'll work it out and you sort of go through and you and and you realize that you're like dramatically lying <laughs> yeah yeah i think every everybody underplays it don't they <laughs> I don't know anyone that goes there and it's totally honest about yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> totally. That is actually genuinely, I'm sure we'll come on to like the perks of being in recovery in a bit. But yeah, yeah, one yeah. of the major ones is when the GP goes, and how much have you drunk this week? You can just go, no, none. Nothing. <laughs> <It's> like, yeah, <laughs> that must like be such a nice feeling. It's like your head and you're like, this is what it was all for. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. So when when you're going through through uni, um, would you say like, did it affect your like studying? Like, how did you do it uni academically? And, and what subject did you did you study actually? Do you know, what? I, stu I studied neuroscience. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, which is not a conventional um, subject. And there's a part of me that thinks I should have known better because I mean, neuroscience isn't like psychology. It's not like how are people acting and how do they respond to this and how has their yeah. upbringing contributed to that and what's going on it's it's the sort of chemistry it's the it's the nuts and bolts behind those behaviors and what's activated in your brain and how your brain sure. interacts and a, a part of that is how your brain interacts with chemicals you know like yeah. caffeine like alcohol like nicotine like cocaine for example um, yeah <laughs> so um, of all the topics to get an insight into what addiction is like and and actually on a sort of very basic molecular level what is happening that is information mm. I knew um and that I mean that actually no one's ever asked me that question before but actually really, really yeah. plays into you know knowing better does not mean that you behave better and I no. think that there's this sort of narrative when it comes to addiction that it's your fault and you've made the wrong choices and you're the idiot and blah, blah, blah. Mm. And there's a part of that that has to be owned. I made a decision to pick up a glass of wine, the same decision that a lot of people make. But I also made a decision to have a line of cocaine. And that is not a decision that a lot of people make. That's a smaller proportion of the population. But I, by the time I realized that I was not able to control that and that I had made the wrong decision. It was, I was incapable of making that choice at all. My capacity to do so had been taken away from me by that dependence. So 
I think that there is choice in starting, but for some people you have no option when it comes to continuing. And that is, that's roulette. There's no, that's a spin of a dice. That's the roll of a dice. There's really no knowing before someone tries it, who is going to pick up that glass of wine and not be able to put it back down and who can, you know, have half a glass of wine and be like, oh, I don't need the rest. A mentality which is mental to me. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's almost like I guess addiction for people that suffer sort of badly with it. It is kind of like a, a higher power to some extent, isn't it? And I guess that your case illustrates that really well because you know you studied neuroscience. You know you, you understood the the substances that that you were taking, be it alcohol or, or cocaine or whatever. But even understanding it on a sort of much deeper level than most people, that that wasn't enough yeah. to kind of deter you from doing it. You know, which shows there's kind of something stronger at play did it did it kind of like affect your grades like binge drinking at, at uni or did you kind of sort of coast through and, yeah. and manage to get through okay I didn't do badly at all actually um I got a 2-1 which is um it's good yeah, yeah. really positive grade I don't mm. know if I had not had the alcohol if I would have been able to achieve like a first the highest grade I don't think I need that I think that that is like a really really to have even got a degree and got a 2-1 I think is really exceptional so I can't I can't claim I mean potentially there was an impact but I can't claim that as a result I didn't have one of those stories where I dropped out or failed miserably or anything like that I can't say that I didn't enjoy the time um it was very difficult to juggle hangovers and drinking and partying with um study but again that's a story that someone who is not alcoholic could could tell you as well you know so I think I think I I think I, I think I got away with it is what I would say, but it right. was, it started to impact my working life in work. And that was after the cocaine. So when I finished university, I went and um, worked in hospitality. So I took a completely different route. I didn't pursue anything neuroscience wise. I worked in hospitality as an events manager for a group of restaurants um, in, in London. And then I moved into sort of sales and marketing. And as part of that, there was a lot of partying, a lot of entertaining of wealthy clients, a lot of sort of launch parties and things like that. And, and there were a lot of nights out and there's a real mentality. Hospitality is toxic for people in addiction. It, it plays into this like it's, it's the desirable job because people have this sort of work hard, play hard mentality, particularly people who are prone to sort of addiction. They, they want to throw absolutely everything they have into a job. And if you want to do that, hospitality is a place because it strips you of your social life. You're working evenings, you're working long hours. It's hard, it's physical. People are tense. There are drunk people around you, you know, but also you're creating something. You're creating an event and hosting and, and there's something really special about that, interacting with people. And, and you can almost sort of showboat in it. And it's just perfect for people with sort of massive egos, but really low self-esteem. And that's the addicts, you know. Uh, and there yeah, we are, yeah. ready to be the life and soul of your party and hate ourselves afterwards. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, so you so you go into this field of hospitality, and yeah, like you say, it does seem like a bit of a yeah recipe for disaster, if you like, really, for someone who's susceptible to yeah. to that kind of thing. So, so, like, talk me through the the first time that it, that cocaine was offered to you in that environment. Like, how how did you feel, and yeah. how did it kind of play out that that first? Uh, it was offered first to me a lot, and I said no because I just drank and I didn't take cocaine. I wasn't the person who took cocaine, so I would say no a lot, and then it became that we were going out with colleagues or with friends sort of not just twice a week, four or five times a week. And it was just so unsustainable. And I remember it was like 6 a.m. And I was at someone's house and like we'd had this sort of party. There was like a pool table and drinks and everything like that. And they'd all been taking cocaine apart from me. And then um, and there was a line left on the table. And I was sitting there on my own and I just thought, what's the fuss about so I put my finger in it and then just rubbed it on my gums and nothing happened the, the amount I took would have been so tiny nothing happened but it kind of so I had had no physical response or or if I had it was so minor I hadn't noticed the response to it but because I'd crossed that line I tried it to my mind that meant I could keep trying it so then the next week I was out somewhere and oh no we'd been out 
come back to my flat for a sort of after party. It was probably 3 a.m. Everyone's sitting around the table and people handed around this cocaine on a, on a book. And I said I was going to do some. And my friend said, no, you don't take that. And I was like, and I said, like, what is sort of true, but also a lie. I was like, no, I've done it before. And she was like, have you? And I yeah. thought, well, yeah, I have. Yeah. So that was my first line. And I probably did like three or four lines that evening. I say evening, by, the, by now we're talking early hours of the morning. It was up until 2 p.m. the next day. My heart, I can remember lying on my, my sofa bed. I don't know why I didn't sleep in my bed. I was on my own sofa bed. My heart was pounding. I couldn't sleep. And I thought, you've tried it now. You're done game over you can tick it off your bucket list everyone tries something once you've dabbled you haven't enjoyed it you can't sleep that you've got nothing out of this you know close that book close that chapter and then I was like a week later or something I was at a really fancy restaurant in in London and I was in their sort of like garden bar thing with my boss and a couple of other people and somebody random said oh, I've got, um, I've got some, some cocaine. Do you want some? And I initially turned it down. And then I thought to myself, no, he went off to the toilet to take it. And I thought, no, I want some. And I went after him and I said, can I have some when he was done, even though I'd already turned it down. And as I went into the toilet, I thought, that's weird because you don't want to do this, but you're doing it. Mm. And I was aware then that that was dangerous, but would never have called that addiction at that stage. You know, I, I think I was, I think I was caught early, like yeah. three. And after that, it was weekly. And then, and then it became more and more frequent. Yeah. Yeah. And so at the, at the height of it, how, how many times a week would you be taking it? Four, maybe four times a week. And then I'd have to take a day or two around, like uh, scattered in between to recover. I didn't have a time. I remember a boyfriend of mine at the time saying he'd never seen me not drunk or hungover, like either one yeah. do. And like yeah. for a four month relationship, that's pretty remarkable, you know, it to is. have not spent time just, yeah. just normal, you know. And how, how are you feeling like physically and mentally, like in yourself during during that time? Is it like, are you feeling quite like down and, and depressed or are you kind of just sort of up such a high percentage of the time that that you kind of don't stop to realize like because I don't know I think someone would imagine that you'd probably feel pretty pretty low and pretty 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 bad during that time but how 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 was it for you um I wasn't present enough in myself to check in with myself um right. so I wasn't well uh but I didn't I, I tried my best not to allow myself self space to feel that. So um, physically, I was I got numbness in my fingers and toes and, and floaters in front of my eyes and nosebleeds. And um, obviously, the effects of always being drunk or hungover meant that I sort of had a consistent headache and and the things associated with that. Um, I got a twitch on my face when I drank too much. Oh, wow. Too tired. Mm which was yeah. um, the result of sort of excessive alcohol consumption. Um, mm. So, yeah, physically really badly. Mentally, um, mentally I was low, but there's just no way of knowing when you're medicating like that. When, you know, you, you, you cannot attribute moods to anything other than drugs because mm -hmm. there's just you don't give yourself enough time to flush anything out of your system to work out actually where your dopamine levels are because you're yeah. so busy manipulating them and and boosting them and then trying to replenish depleted supplies that actually I just wouldn't have known um I I wouldn't have described myself as happy but I would have described myself as blinkers on just plowing on not looking left or right at the destruction around me just refusing to and in terms of self-care like I wasn't washing properly I didn't wash my clothes I didn't do life admin I had like a stack of letters that I was terrified of like the I remember my mum didn't live far away and the postman would give her my post because my the post box that was on the outside of my door just could not physically fit more letters in because I never emptied it so he would be like look it's your it's your daughter down the road can I give you these which I'm sure is not really an, allowed but what could he do you know he knew yeah. that we were family so that's it um 
so yeah i was doing i was doing badly i think it's fair to say mm. yeah i can imagine that must have been really 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 tough but mm. y- you were you were functional at the time as in like you still went to work and like nobody really pulled you up on it or like were, were people starting to sort of notice and did it affect yeah did it affect your job so yeah i, I was going to work yes it mm. affected my job yes people started to notice one of my colleagues right. said that like every day he saw me i looked more like a crackhead like i just was not it was apparent that I wasn't taking care of myself properly and I pulled it together enough you know to make the sales that I needed or to to turn up to the meetings and it was a really drink and drug heavy culture anyway so uh people who could challenge you were fewer and further between because it was very much like sort of people chucking around stones in those glass houses you know like absolutely um, yeah yeah but there were people who challenged me there were people who asked if I was okay there were people who who yeah were worried about me um I was consistently late and that was a big source of frustration for the people in my office as well um I wasn't very easy to work with I don't think um yeah but yeah yeah but but got by sure. One one thing that I'm always like I'm always curious about, especially when I hear about like addiction stories with with cocaine, is mm. you know how much how much were you spending on it? Like let's say weekly, because you know it's certainly not the the cheapest drug I imagine to 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 have an addiction to. And and how how did you afford that? Yeah. So I understand that recently in the in the six years that I've given up, I understand that the price has really escalated. So I was paying 50 pounds a gram. At the moment, I think that for the same quality of cocaine, you probably need to spend 80. So like I got out at the right time, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know. And actually, that's a really tabloid question. I've done a lot of interviews with tabloids, and it's the first thing that they and that's I'm a tabloid journalist, so not a problem to have yeah. that, that inclination. If the yeah. first question that they ask me is how much did you spend because it makes a great headline because then absolutely work out like mm. you know how, how did you, you know it's it's an it's an additional level of outrage sort of like the waste and it is wasteful and I did waste a huge amount of money and it's not even just the cocaine it's the amount of alcohol that you're spending it's entry to clubs it's it's taxis because public transport's finished it's all it makes me feel sick if i actually calculated not just what i spent on drugs but on the on the things that supported that it would yeah. be it would be a horrible horrible horrific figure but the the figure that i have previously used which i mean it's it's in national press so i don't want to say it's wrong but i didn't put a huge amount of thought behind the calculation um, yeah it's i can about imagine yeah, yeah. pounds yeah which would have yeah. been four grams which i think would have been about right yeah but I, honestly i mean who knows really who knows yeah exactly. But, exactly but that is a huge that's rent that is a huge amount of money if that's correct you know? but also there is an element of the people around me would buy it and i would take some of theirs and sometimes i would buy it and someone would take mine so i think there was a, a lot of the time where I had there was cocaine around that I hadn't actually paid for, but I was sure. taking. So I mean, yeah, I think it's a blessing to me that I don't have a clear figure because I think that's absolutely, right. yeah, yeah. I can imagine. I can imagine how 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 dark did it get? Um, like what what were some of the low low points? Um, are, are there any that stand out in particular to you? Well, so. I th- I think I had two rock bottoms and I think people hear about this sort of concept of addiction um and hear about this sort of concept of rock bottoms and they think like that that's that there's a- almost that's the sort of one turning point but you'll hear a lot of people in recovery and in addiction say that every rock bottom has a trap door which is why I have to, um, but there was one moment where I had been out with friends and I um, went to pick up a couple of grams of cocaine and they didn't take cocaine, they were my friends from university. And the plan was to go to a club after um, dinner, but they changed their mind about doing that. And they decided that they um, just wanted to go home. It was a Thursday night, they had work the next day, they didn't party like I did, so they just wanted to go. But I had these two grams. So I went home and I called an ex-boyfriend who came over and we sat up taking these grams. And then I did my last line at like 7.30 a.m. So the time I should have been getting up to go to work. And I called my boss and I just said, I'm high. I'm not coming. And, wow. um, 
and my boss is also a friend and actually I'm still friends with her now and I think she had seen a sort of spiral and 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 quite rightly saw that not as sort of straightforward skiving but actually as like illness as something that needs to be something that needs to be treated carefully so she said okay I'm gonna we're gonna say that you're unwell today and that you're not coming in and then we're gonna talk about this and we'll make a plan um but actually I called my sister who's never been into any kind of drugs who has always been um just a sort of model daughter to our parents sure, sure. And, um, and she and she came over and I said like I've been taking drugs and I don't really know what to do about it and she was amazing she moved me in with her she encouraged me to leave the the hospitality industry and and she actually typed up my resignation letter gave it to me on Monday and said sign this and give it to your boss on Monday and my boss having already had that chat was not completely surprised by that it it completely catch her off guard she was incredibly supportive Mm. um so yeah so that was it so that was the first time and then I decided to move to Paris I thought I had a group of friends over there I thought if I could get out of London get away from the parties and the drugs and the people it would be a fresh start but I carried on drinking really heavily there and then I met somebody who um I was dating who started bringing me drugs and um we had one I had gone out for one glass of wine with a friend and I had like convinced her it was only going to be for one I just really wanted to you know go to the pub or whatever she left after one true to her word I stayed out this guy had a really messy heavy night woke up with a black eye and absolutely like no idea how it got there and just like it took me a few weeks of like working out sort of what happened there and and how I felt about it but that was the straw that broke the camel's back really and that's when when that happened my friends pulled me to one side and said like you've come to Paris you've made amazing progress but you're drinking really heavily and you need to you need to do something about it so they found a, a support group for cocaine addicts they encouraged me to go um and I, and I think at the time I thought if I didn't, I ran the risk of just losing them, of just not being invited out, of just not, because they couldn't keep watching me go over the same thing. And it, it was Groundhog Day. It was, I'd go out, I'd get too drunk, I might take some drugs or do something stupid or whatever. And then they'd sit with me while I cried in the morning and they were just like, we love you, we, we're happy to do that for you, but nothing's changing. You know? yeah. And and this yeah. has got to stop. So. In terms of of my story, and I've and I worked with so many people in in addiction and recovery, and it just makes me feel increasingly grateful that I had the family and the friends around me to do that. Um, and in sobriety, I'm, I'm sure that in the sort of timeline we'll get onto that. Yeah, 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 yeah. That I've really realised is that. Um, everyone's susceptible to addiction there's there's nothing racially or class-wise or whatever that protects you from it you can be the richest person or the poorest person and that may affect the substance you get addicted to or something like that but but it's 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 open to all it's indiscriminate and it it doesn't make a difference really but what does make a difference is that there's when it comes to making a decision Um, to get clean there is a certain group of people that are more successful at that and that is people who have had higher education it's people who have a supportive family whose parents stayed together who were taken to church who who had parents who read to them who aren't in minority backgrounds who have got friends and a supportive peer group who have got the money to move themselves around if they need to and when I look at those things I was always going to win like and I did and I walked into a recovery meeting after they told me to and that was it I got sober and everything was in my favor but when you when you look at the people who don't make it the people who just try and try and try you know it's it's weighted and it's so unjust the the people of a lower socioeconomic background people with dysfunctional families people who already have comorbid mental health problems the odds are just stacked against them 
not in whether or not you'll become an addict, but whether you'll be able to stop. And that just strikes me as so unfair. And I think if I'm honest, I feel guilty about it because it mm. was it was all there for the taking for me, mm. you know. Sure. And and I had always been brought up around a family that said like just try you know you may fail but try and I remember as a kid telling my dad I really wanted the Spice Girls to come and perform at my primary school (laughs) and he was like write them a letter he didn't tell me don't be ridiculous darling there's no spices he said write them a letter you know and that was that was the attitude I was raised with like give it a go. It doesn't matter if you fail, but success is there. You know, you can hope for it if you work, for yeah. it, if you put yourself out there and people who don't have that message just don't, don't have that level of success. And there was this study, sure. um, there was this study with cannabis addiction. I'm properly going off now. Sorry. No, 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 no. Sorry, carry on. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, carry on, please. There was this study with um, <laughs> cannabis addiction and it says, it's a uh, area of addiction that's only just starting to be studied more because for years and years, people would come to rehab facilities and drug and alcohol centers, and they would have a problem with heroin, cocaine, alcohol, nicotine, something like that, but not with cannabis. But cannabis uh, cannabis would be a secondary drug that they took as well, but it wasn't their primary drug. Yeah. Cannabis is getting stronger. There's synthetic cannabinoids. There's all of this stuff. It is causing far more problems than it was, say, 20 years ago. So people mm. are now presenting with it. So as soon as people start presenting at the NHS with this problem, people are paying for research on it. So these studies are coming up. And there's no pharmaceutical intervention you can give a cannabis addict. You can give um, a heroin addict um, opiate substitute treatment. So you can give them you know, methadone or something to help wean them off. There's nothing like that for cannabis addicts. No. Overriding thing that dictated the success of somebody who was a cannabis addict in this study. um, So the people who managed to be successful and the ones who didn't when they tried to get into recovery was self-efficacy. So the belief at the beginning that they could do it, that was it. That's what defined it. And the difference for me was that I had enough behind me that I believed I could do it. Uh, Sure. And I just think it's so important for people who are part of that journey to believe they can do it. And they can, because there's, you know, they just can. There's like so much support out there and so many tools in place. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, regardless of the fact that <clears throat> you might have had the odds in your favor, as, as you just de- as you describe, um, it's still an incredible achievement that at the first, you know, at the first crack, you managed to to uh, to stop doing it and get sober. I think I think that's incredible. How, so how, how for how many years have you been sober now? Uh, so it was six years on the 22nd of April. So what is that? May, June, July, August. So uh, six and a third years. Wow. I'm still young enough that I count the fractions like a child. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's like a ten-year-old. Yeah, and six and a yeah. half. Like exactly. Exactly. <laughs> well, I think I think that's amazing. And so, um, it was it was a sort of three or four-year period that you were that you were taking cocaine. Okay. Really short, sure, really short, sure. and that is a huge blessing as well. So I was drinking from thirteen, but I was, as I say, only taking cocaine from twenty-two, and I got clean at twenty-five. So. So three years and what a blessing because what would have been worse than dying mm. Of, mm. of drugs and alcohol would have been the 10 20 years of drugs and alcohol it would have taken me to get there where I would have slowly watched everything just fall down around me my friends my work like my financial situation everything so the fact that it was so short is is the biggest gift yeah yeah well thank god that you managed to to get out of it yeah mm-hmm. and so for you it was the 12 it was the 12 steps right that yeah. that helped you get out of it if you could give just like a really brief summary <laughs> of of that and, and how and how it helped you i love how you clarified really brief because that is something that i could be here for like two hours talking, yeah. <laughs> talking yeah. about that um, exactly <laughs> three hour interview yeah, yeah. So the 12 Steps of Recovery were founded by um, Bill Johnson and Dr. Bob, who are the two guys who collaborated to set up Alcoholics Anonymous in America in the 1930s. Um, And they together sort of defined this program that had really helped them. And they summarized it in 12 steps. And effectively, the first three steps are recognizing 
um, that there's a higher power and it's not you. Um, so what they established was in the format of Christianity, but um, in in the years following that, that's been sort of replaced by a general spirituality, which a lot of people relate better to. So just the idea of a higher power um, in whatever in whatever concept that that works for you. And for some people, that's as simple as acknowledging that a group of people gathered together with a common purpose are stronger yeah. than them as an individual. And there's no denying that. There's nothing supernatural about that. But then for sure. other people like me, I go to church. So that's sort of Christian God, but other people have got other faiths and other religions and, and that sort of thing. Um, so then steps four and five are an inventory where you look at where life has taken you um, and you you document effectively your fears, your sexual interactions, your um, the ways that you treated other people badly, the harms that you've caused, and um, your resentments. And they can really be sources of, well, resentment can really drag you down, um, and sexual things and ways that you've harmed people can be a real source of shame as well, which is, which is incredibly damaging. Uh, sure. Six and seven are sort of, once you've got that overview of where things have gone wrong, is like an opportunity to identify common themes and character defects in that. And that's, you know, that is things like fears and low self-esteem and pride. And if those things are dragging you down, it's, it's shedding them. And acknowledging that um, eight and nine are looking at how you've hurt others and making amends to those things. So cleaning yeah. your side of the street um, right. and then 10, 11 and 12 are sort of maintaining those practices. So making sure that you continue to make amends promptly, that you have a quiet time, like a meditative sort of prayer time in whatever that looks like. And then also that you carry that message to the addict who still suffers so you are yeah. present and available to people um who need to hear that message in the way that people were for you um yeah. and that is it sounds like a sort of altruistic thing for somebody else but actually in a massively selfish way supporting other people is it, it props up your recovery massively as well absolutely absolutely and which part of that 12-step process was the hardest part for you <sighs> The two parts that everyone, so I've done the 12 steps a number of times now and have um, worked with tens of sponsees over the years who've also sure. done it. So I'm really familiar with the process and the intricacies of it. And the first time round, you are freaked out about doing the inventory. You don't want to sit there and tell someone that you're really angry at this person, that person, that you certainly don't want to talk about sex. Or yeah, you, <laughs> awkward. <laughs> um, and to list off like ways that you've harmed other people, like it's, it's shameful and that was really tough. And then also to go and apologize to some people, that was tough. And that's what really frees you out. But there's a magic in it and you do it with a sponsor, somebody who's already in recovery, who's just that little bit ahead of you. And to hear that person say like, it's okay. You're not, you're not evil. You've made some bad mistakes. Like, yes, those things were wrong and you hurt yourself and you hurt other people. And I'm not condoning those actions, but you're not wrong like you're still loved you're still worthy of love this is not the worst thing i've ever heard and sometimes my sponsor would just be like oh yeah me too and you, it's like you're like darkest deepest fear but actually there's a real consistency in the stories of people in recovery and you're like what you did that too well, yeah me and it's yeah. so nice you're just like we're that, not in this alone <laughs> yeah that must be such a comforting feeling yeah it's it's magic. It's it's the biggest release. Yeah, it's incredible. It's it's yeah. I I could not believe how amazingly um, my sponsor walked through that process with me and how easy she made it for me. And a lot of those things were the reasons why I thought I wasn't good enough, and yeah. reasons why I thought I should keep drinking and and just and just drown it out. And things that I didn't want to face up to and I didn't want to talk about. And um, just airing it in such a safe way with somebody who is so non-judgmental was, mm. was just a spectacular process. Wow. Wow. And fast forward to, to the here and now, you're, you're now a writer who also helps reco other recovering addicts. Is that right? Yeah. Just tell me, tell, a, tell me a bit about yeah, where you're at now, what you're doing and, and how different life is. Um, life now is so different that if you had asked me on my first day in recovery what I wanted for my life, I 
would have told you less than what I have because I didn't realize what was available. You know, I wouldn't have been able to dream for what I have now because I would have yeah. thought those dreams were too big. I, and I, I just put myself in such a small box, living such a small, repetitive life. And the freedom and the opportunity that has come from, from sobriety is like nothing I could have imagined. And I really wow. don't say that lightly. Like it is hands down the best decision and my proudest achievement of my life. It really doesn't matter what I achieve in my life. You know, this is it. This is, this is the biggest thing I've ever done. Um, and I would never take it back, despite it being huge, hugely difficult, a massive journey. Um, so I, I moved back from Paris after about a year and a half. I trained as a journalist and I went and, and worked in tabloid journalism um, for a few years. And then I um, took a break from journalism and went to King's College London to do a master's in addiction studies which is why I've got all of these stats and studies and exactly <laughs> a little chest of knowledge yeah, like knocking around in my head and then um um and over the course of that time as well I started running a recovery course which is wow. for people who struggle with any kind of addiction so not just substances um and that yeah so we worked with people who are addicted to porn and sex to food um obviously to substances as well gambling codependency is uh, is like it's the pandemic before the pandemic came like, yeah. i'm telling yeah. you it's just crazy um, really yeah, yeah and it, and it, that has been like transformational i've been doing that for about five years and i think i started off with a level of naivety which was knocked out of me quite fast like that is, yeah. it was a steep yeah. learning curve but people's lives have been changed and transformed and when I hear people talk about the course and, and the way that the other people who led on that course have helped them like I just think like it it was all the pain that I went through was maybe worth it I don't know is that a funny thing to say like I no I don't well, I don't I don't think it is at all and although I've not lived it like I, I just I can imagine it's such an incredible feeling to have been there yourself firsthand and to be able to help people out of the sort of depths of darkness that you you know only too well. It must be just an incredibly rewarding feeling. And as you say, in, in some way, maybe worth it. Um, so I definitely don't think that's that strange to say. I can I can understand it. Um, I think it's an incredible, an incredible story to have come from from where you were back then to to where you are today. I just think it's it's fantastic. And a way of um, finishing off, Lauren, at the end of each uh, podcast, I try and get guests to give listeners um, a couple of sort of key bits of advice if um, maybe they're listening and they find themselves in a similar situation. So what sort of, you know, one, two or three bits of advice would you give to someone who's listening who might be in the situation you were in six, seven years ago? If you're finding that something you're doing is affecting your relationships with yourself, with your friends, with your family, with your work, with your higher power, with any of those things, then it is worth addressing. And if you find you can't address it, um, then, then recognizing that you may be dealing with an addiction could be the first step to actually reclaiming your life. And I think it's a scary word, but actually, the most powerful thing I've ever heard is someone say, help, like help me. And I don't know a single person in recovery who has recovered in isolation, who's just locked themselves away and done it. Actually, I know a series of the strongest, bravest, most vulnerable people I know who stood in a room and said like, help me. And and people rallied round, strangers rallied round, they swapped numbers, they showed up, they called, they checked in. Um, and, and I think asking for help is incredibly powerful. I think aside from, and I acknowledge the privilege of having all of those things that we spoke about earlier, but aside from those, something that, that made a difference when I did go into recovery is that I took every tool available to me I read the books, I listened to the podcasts, I followed the Instagram accounts. When they said to phone someone in recovery, I picked up the phone. I prayed for voicemail, but I picked up the phone. You know, I did it. I turned up to um, a meeting, a recovery meeting every day for 90 days because it replaced 
the time I'd spent drinking. And if you had enough time to nurture an addiction, you have enough time to nurture recovery. And actually, it will be the most valuable thing that you ever do. So don't do it half-heartedly. Recognize that it is a matter of life and death. And even if the thing that you're addicted to won't kill you, it will stop you living. And that is so important. Like your life is so important. Your life is so valuable. It doesn't matter if it's hard work, it's worth doing. And it is an extreme version of that sort of thing that people say, making a decision today that you'll be grateful you did tomorrow. I've never heard anyone say like, oh, if only I hadn't gotten sober. Like it is, it is the proudest thing you can do. And I encourage anyone to reach out and to take that step. Thank you uh, so much for for taking the time to come on. Um, I think your story is is really inspirational, and I just I love the way that you talk about it in such a such an honest and and detailed and and in, an enthusiastic way. I just think it's fantastic. I hope that um, if anyone's listening that's gone through a similar situation, that this this is this has helped them. And yeah, above all, uh, thank you, thank you very much. Thanks, thanks for having me. That's it for today's episode, guys. If you liked it or found it useful, give it a thumbs up. And if you want to see more interviews, make sure you subscribe. And most importantly, thanks a lot for watching. If you've got a story that you'd like to share on the podcast, get in touch. Give me a shout. I'd love to hear from you at info at backontrackpodcast.com.